Good morning, and welcome to the Refuge Church online gathering. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wider doors with a welcome from Jesus, the friend of sinners. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can gather this morning in person and also here online. We ask that you would meet with us through this time of singing and also in your word and through this sound of prayer. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's sing.
our sin and our guilt yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured there where the blood of the lamb was spilled grace grace God's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold Points to the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace Freely bestowed on all who believe You who are longing to see His face Will you this moment His grace receive? Yes, receive Grace, grace sin, yes, grace that is greater than all our sin, grace that is greater than all our sin. Well, thank you for singing with us. We're going to turn our attention now to Holy Scripture, and today we're going to be in Luke chapter 11. And while you're turning there, let me let you know what we are up to as a church right now. We felt the Lord leading us into a significant season of prayer. So we spent last week kind of giving an update on where the church is and where we're going. And we have spent the whole week in prayer. The reports I've been getting from people have been fantastic. And we feel compelled to continue that for at least two more weeks. So today we're going to get some instruction on prayer from Jesus in the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11, and then we'll finish up next week by talking about uh, what else Jesus has to say in Luke chapter 11 regarding prayer. But before we jump into any of this, seems like prayer would be a good place to start. Let me pray, ask for the Spirit's help, and we'll get to work. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and illuminate these texts to us. We ask that we would be informed in our knowledge of Scripture transformed by the renewing of our minds, conformed to the image of Christ, and recommissioned on the Great Commission. Lord, help me, frail as I am, to serve us well in this time. In Jesus' good name, amen. Well, we will spend just a few moments here, and then we will indeed put this passage to work immediately. 
But before we jump into it, I want to give you just a little bit of insight into the context. Uh, Though this is a familiar passage to us, I think it's important to understand where it falls in its context in the Gospel of Luke. Luke, you know, uh, is somewhat of a photo album of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. He is making his way toward Jerusalem uh, here in chapter 11. Uh, There's just been an exchange with Mary and Martha. And now, as his disciples and, and he have drawn aside, they ask him for some particular instruction on how to pray, and we'll explain that as we go. Let me also say uh, that what we have here is perhaps a little different than the Lord's Prayer that some of us might have memorized, and part of the reason why that is is the more typical rendering of that comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew includes a few words and phrases that Luke doesn't include here. But that's no worry at all. In fact, that is a strengthener of why we can trust the Gospels. We've talked about this repeatedly on our journey throughout uh, time as refuge. And when we see these distinctions within the Gospels, they don't say to us, oh, hey, we can't trust the Bible. This guy said this. This guy said this. It's actually the exact opposite because Matthew was written to a different audience than Luke was, and so the fact that there is distinction and there are fine differences shows that these can be trusted, that God was silently and sovereignly superintending all of this. He was inspiring these writers just the way that they needed to be inspired to communicate with their audiences, and they give it that human touch, that reality to show how God use these men to write these books that that are inspired scripture for us, and it certainly helps us a great deal. So that being said, let's pick up the trail right here in verse one. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so the picture here, Jesus is off by himself. He's making his way back. And one of his disciples comes up to him and says, hey, you know what? John taught his disciples to pray. Can you do the same for us? And so that's what this passage is. It is what we often call the Lord's Prayer. But I think more accurately, it's probably better understood as the model prayer or the disciples prayer, because the instruction is from the Lord teaching his disciples, which certainly includes us, how to pray. And I think if you want a metaphor of how to think about this, you need to think of it more of a map than a script. Think of it more of a map than a script. And what I mean by that is that Luke is guiding us toward certain destinations. It's not that we need to pray these exact words. It's not a mantra. It's not Uh, some kind of incantation that we uh, recite to try to get God to do what we want. It's, this is how you need to pray. These are the kinds of things you need to be praying for. You need to structure your prayers in this way, and it will help you on your journey with God. And so what he's going to include here, these destinations include both vertical and horizontal destinations. Vertical in the sense of Uh, We want to think some things about God. We want to say some some things about God. We want to pray some specific things and praise to God. But then also we want to concretely ask for our needs. Okay, so map more than script, vertical as well as horizontal. Verse two, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Now, Uh, First thing to notice here, the you that is used, it is a plural you. It's a corporate prayer. It's it's good for all disciples at all times, everywhere. And you've seen this used repeatedly uh, and, and regularly throughout church history. And there's good reason for that. And also, second thing to notice would be the word father. Now, we gloss over that. We say that so many times. I think it's kind of lost some of its seasoning for us. But let me tell you something, friends, to be able to call the creator God of the universe Father is no small thing. Think about our plight as humans. We are born in sin. We sin on top of that. A great chasm is fixed between us, us and our unholiness, God and his holiness. 
And the only way that we can get from where we are to where God is, is if God intervenes as our Father and saves us and brings us to himself. The Bible says that we were once orphans and strangers, and now we've been made children of God. God is our Father. And that is, that is the basis on which we can approach him. And we don't approach him simply as children that are afraid that he's going to zap us if we ask for the wrong things. No, it is a picture of God that beckons us to come, that welcomes us to come. If I could be so bold to use some anthropomorphic language here, God doesn't have knees, but if, as if he did, it's almost that God is our Father saying, come, climb up on my knee, whisper in my ear, tell me about our relationship, tell me what you need. I want to help. That is the kind of vision of God that Jesus cast for these early disciples and for us. And friends, you can't find this anywhere else. If you went to uh, the, the, what Islam <coughs> has to offer, there is no concept like this, that God would be this near and that he could be our father. If you went to Hinduism, you don't find this. You go to Buddhism, you don't find this. Christianity is the only religion, the only spirituality, the only faith system that offers to us God as father in an intimate way. And so when we see this, we should have a moment of gospel amazement. Knowing who we are, even in the midst of it, God as our Father welcomes us to come. That's why Jesus says to pray this way. Remember who he is. Remember who he is to you. And then what does he say after that? Father, hallowed be your name. Now let's start with the word name here. At this time in history, when someone's name was spoken of, it's not just talking about their, their title. It's not just a, a way of communicating. It's talking about their character. It's talking about their attributes. It's the sum total of who they are. It is their reputation. And so when Jesus says, Father, hallowed be your name, that word hallowed is extremely important because it means holy. And it is not so much a petition that is being made here. It is an act of worship. It is an exaltation of the holiness of God, that he is infinitely glorious and blindingly perfect, that he is set apart unto himself as entirely unique in all of creation, that there never has been, never will be, and is there is no one like our God. He is holy. He is perfect. He is blindingly righteous. And when he says, Father, hallowed be your name, the tense of the verb that he's using here, he's saying, we want to worship you. We want to glorify you. We want to honor you now. And we also want this to be the case forever, for eternity. And so this is an example of the, the already and the not yet that we see at work within the Bible time and time again. That we are part of this present reality. We are praying in this present reality. But when we say, Father, hallowed be your name, we are saying we want to tune, tune our tuning fork to what is happening in eternity. We want this to be the case forever, that God would be exalted forever. Now next, he also says, your kingdom come. Now, a lot of ink has been rightly spilt on what is the kingdom of God. Well, let me give it to you as simply as I can. It is the realm where what God wants done is done. It's the rule and reign of God. And when Matthew talks about this, he says, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that really strikes to the heart of what is being said here. That Jesus is saying, hey, disciples, pray in this way so that heaven comes to earth. So that God's glory, which is being heralded forever in heaven, that that happens here. 
that the kind of justice that exists there would happen here, that the kind of honor toward one another that happens in heaven would happen here, that there would be love, that there would be kindness, that God's agenda, God's rule, God's reign, that it would happen here as it does there. That's how we're to pray. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And I think it's really important that we understand this because this kind of prayer, this exalting of God, this exalting in God, this celebrating the greatness of God for who he is and what he's done in Christ, that does not come naturally to us. Most of our prayers pick up with where we now go in verse 3. Give us our daily bread. And listen, Jesus cares about daily bread. He does. But it's good and wise and right to begin our prayers reminding ourselves of the greatness of God and praying for his glory and his agenda and his kingdom to come and not simply our own. We got to put first things first. We got to put the horse in front of the proverbial cart. And when we do, it orients us, it changes, it transforms, it orients our hearts in a Godward direction so that when we begin to ask and pray for the kinds of things that we need to pray for in verse three and following, we are pointed in the right direction. Jesus knew that we needed to hear this. Do we hear it today? Is this how we pray today? Or do we immediately jump into verse three kind of prayers? Oh, friends, if we do, let the Lord help us today through what we've learned. And now let's talk about verse three. Give us each day our daily bread. Now, this phrase daily bread here, it was literal, but I think it also goes beyond simply bread. It would have been talking about food, of course, but there's the, 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 the sum total of all our daily needs and provisions that is within the scope of what Jesus is saying. He's saying we should pray for all that we need to survive and thrive in this world. And this comes up every day. And for this audience, this would have been even more important. These were not people that were on any kind of tenure track. These were not people that had a long history of, I've got this much in the bank and we can draw on it in a time of emergency. These were people that many of which would have been, they would have been day laborers almost, that they would have needed food to get through the day. And you also think about just the way their culture was at the time. They didn't have refrigeration like we do. This was an ongoing need, and they were very much in touch with the, the, their need for daily bread. And Jesus says, ask for it. The verb that is used here for give us each day could be translated like this. Give us this, and please keep giving us this. They were deeply in touch with their need for God and their need for his intervention. Verse four, and forgive us our sins for as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now there's a couple of things that this reveals to us here. First of all, it's that we need forgiveness. Now all of us, like I said before, born in sin, sin on top of that, we have a deep fundamental need to be forgiven and to be brought into a right relationship with God. That's what most people would call being saved or becoming a Christian. And the way that happens is, is it's like the ABCs. We have to admit that we're a sinner. We have to believe in the perfect life, the substitute's death and the glorious resurrection of Jesus. And C, we have to commit our life to follow him. We have to transfer the leadership of our life over to Jesus. We turn from sin and we trust in Christ. And if you hear that today and that sounds new and novel to you, friend, it could be that even through this message today, the Lord is calling you to forgiveness in him. 
And if that's the case, then, then my sincere plea would be that you put your faith and trust in Jesus now. And then reach out to us. We want to help you uh, take this next step on your spiritual journey. And we want to help you any way that we can. Just shoot us an email, refugefranklin at gmail.com. So we all need forgiveness. And then what Jesus is speaking about here is that we need forgiveness even after we become Christians. Now, it's not the same kind of forgiveness. It's not this once for all, break with the old life, trust in Jesus, forgiven with a capital F, if you want to think of it that way. But it's this ongoing forgiveness. Maybe one way you could think of it would be like this, that when you become a Christian, you take a bath, so to speak. But the kind of forgiveness that he's talking about here is more like washing your hands. But it is needful. The Bible is replete with scriptures that talk about how uh, that unconfessed sin in our lives will hijack the effectiveness of our prayers. The Psalms talk about it. The New Testament talks about it. So we need to keep, as one writer said, short accounts with God. We need to be constantly confessing our sins and asking for forgiveness. And that's part of what Jesus is getting at here in this model prayer, disciples prayer, the Lord's prayer. And he also talks about here <clears throat> that we are to extend forgiveness to others. So any sense of holding grudges or I'm not going to forgive them because they wronged me to certain degrees, uh, Christians need to dispense with that because we are to forgive others because we have been forgiven. And so we need to hear that and be convicted by that and helped by that in this way. Next phrase, he also says here, and lead us not into temptation. Now, this one's a little more tricky, isn't it? Because we know that God is not going to lead us into temptation in the sense of hanging a carrot out there and trying to get us to sin. That's pretty much the opposite of what God is about in his infinite holiness. But what he is getting at here is that temptation is part and parcel of living in a fallen world. We can't look anywhere, we can't get online, we can't really go anywhere without being tempted to do something sinful. And what he's saying here is, is that this is a prayer that God would keep his children on the right track when temptation comes. It would be akin to something like this. Lord, as the, the storm of temptation rages, please keep me firm and strong in this tumult. So when we think about this, and we think about this instruction and this help that, that Jesus has given us today, this is a profoundly helpful passage to our prayer lives, isn't it? It reminds us of who God is. It reorients us to a gospel amazement. It also shows us what we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about the, the, uh, the, the exaltation of God's name. It shows us we need to be praying for the advancement of his kingdom. And it also shows us and reminds us that it is good and right and needful to be praying about very practical things in our lives. To be praying for our daily bread, to be praying for our physical needs, to be praying for strength, to, to, to persevere in temptation, to be seeking forgiveness and also extending forgiveness. And so this model prayer that the Lord has given us, doesn't it communicate the heart of God? Doesn't it just draw you in? Doesn't it just say to you, goodness, God cares for me. He cares for me to the point that he is helping me know how to better approach him, how to better speak with him, how to better live this life that we have before us. And so friends, as we leave this time of teaching, I want to do two things. I want to remind you of the greatness of the God of the Bible. And I want to take the rest of our time immediately applying what we just learned. Because the Lord has called us to this season of prayer. The Lord is answering the prayers that we've been praying all week.
the prayers that we will pray this week, the prayers that we will pray next week. The Lord hears us, friend. He is helping us as individuals and he is helping us as a church. And if that's the case, why in the world would we not go to him with our needs and the needs of our church? So get comfortable, get still, and let's apply this passage by praying together now. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come before you and we thank you for this passage. We thank you for what it tells us about you, that you are indeed our Father, that we are no longer orphans, that we are no longer wandering in life without a family, but that we belong to you and you have given us your church to be a part of. Lord, we say thank you for that. And Lord, just like you taught us to pray in this passage, we want to pray, hallowed be your name. Lord, we want to confess that you are holy. We want to pray that we would grow in our awareness of that, that that would lead us toward a greater hatred of our sin, a greater embrace of a holy life. And Lord, that you would raise us up Lift our eyes, lift our hearts so that we might see the greatness of who you are and what you've done in all the world, but particularly in Christ. Lord, we lay hold of all of the good news of your attributes that are revealed in the gospel. Your kindness, your mercy, your faithfulness, your fulfillment of your promises in Jesus. Lord, no one else can do these things but you. And Lord, out of that, we want to pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that in our own lives. We pray that for our children. We pray that for our church, that as we are in this season of prayer and reset and thinking through what it is that you have for us, for the next leg of the journey. Lord, we pray that you would give us unusual wisdom, that you would give us unusual insight, that you would give us unusual patience and also boldness to step into whatever it is you have for us on the next leg of the journey. Lord, we pray for our daily bread as individuals, as families, and as a church. We pray that you would meet the needs of our families. We pray that you would meet the needs of our church. Lord, certainly that includes financial needs, both on the individual and family and church basis. That will at some point include, we need another location to meet in because the time is gonna run out at Winstead. Lord, we pray that you would provide for that. We know you will, you always have. We also pray for, uh, the, the, the daily bread uh, of more volunteers in our ministry. Lord, we thank you for people that are already stepping up because of the work you're doing in their hearts. Lord, we also pray for the continued healing for my physical body that I'd be able to, uh, to lead us as best I can. We pray for just continued provision in the personal ministries of all of our people. We pray that you would provide that kind of daily bread. In addition to that, we also pray for forgiveness for our sins. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for those things that we have done wrong that we know of, and Lord, even the things that we don't. The sins of commission, the sins of omission. Lord, we pray that we would also be forgivers of others, that we would not be grudge holders but that we would seek to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Lord, we pray also that you would deliver us from temptation, that as we go into this week, that you would help us to have discernment to see where we could be about to step into some kind of pitfall, where we could be about to go off the rails spiritually. Lord, prevent that and also if it happens, 
Help us to run right back to you. Lord, I also pray that in this season as a church that that you would deliver us from the temptation of trying to do this ourselves. Lord, we have prayed from the beginning of the journey as refuge that we would see what only you can do. And Lord, you are leading us into a deeper season of that. And you're answering our prayers. We are seeing what only you can do can do. We're thankful for it. We pray for more of it. We pray that you would always deliver us from the temptation of just trying to do this on our own, but that we would truly be your church before you and unified with one another with what you're calling us to do. Lord, in addition, we think of the other struggles that are represented within our church the things that people don't talk about very often, the heavy burdens of depression and anxiety and just coming out of this pandemic season that has been so, so difficult. Lord, I pray for these brothers and sisters that carry heavy weights that not everyone knows about. Lord, I also pray for those that are in a season of trying to make big decisions, selling houses, buying houses, trying to decide about different kinds of school for the children for the fall. Lord, all these things, we we bring them to you. We ask for your help and your intervention, knowing that you are going to respond. Lord, we also pray for marriages, both in this church and beyond this church. The pandemic season has been hard on so many marriages. Lord, we lift them to you. We ask for what only you can do in these marriages. Lord, in addition to that, we pray for parenting and and for children and for students. And Lord, that you would continue to, as this seems to be coming to a close, that you would bring healing into the lives of children that have been deeply affected by this. We pray for what only you can do in those areas. Lord, as we look toward the future for refuge, We pray that you would continue to lead us down the path that you would have for us, that you would lead us into deeper discipleship, lead us into greater evangelism. Lord, send us the people that you want us to have. Lord, let us deploy and encourage everyone who comes through our doors. Lord, give us wisdom, give us strength, give us kindness toward one another, continue to cultivate a gospel culture among us. And Lord, we pray, just as Jesus taught us to pray, that you would do all this for the sake of your name, for the advancement of your kingdom, and for your glory. And we pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name.
thank you for singing with us. I want to give us just a couple of announcements here before we head on our way. First of all, if you were with us here for the first time, thank you so much for joining us. This is only one expression of our community. Uh, we meet every week in person at 1030 on Sunday mornings at Winstead Elementary in South Franklin. Uh, all of our ministries are back open now, and we would love to have you come and join us, um, and it, we would welcome you and your entire family to do so soon. If you have questions about uh, where we are and where we're coming from, just shoot us an email, refugefranklin at gmail.com, and we will help you any way that we can. Uh, also, would encourage you to continue to check your email every week. We send out a, a, usually a couple of emails uh, in this season of prayer. We will keep these requests before us. The Lord is hearing us. The Lord is answering these prayers, and we want you to know what's going on. So please stay tuned in with that. If you need uh, a community group to get involved in, you want to be a part of men's or women's ministry, we just need to know that. We'll help you get connected as quickly as possible and as deeply as possible. That's it by way of announcements. Let me pray for us and you have a great rest of the day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had to be together. We thank you for our in-person gathering. We pray that you would continue to show us what only you can do. In Jesus' good name, amen. Take care.